I'm just so excited to be able to be here today and be able to talk to you. And I'm very excited about uh, what God promises us and about the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. I want to start today with a question. Now, this will require some participation from you at home. So I want you to listen carefully. Let me ask you this question. Has there ever been a time in your life that you have experienced something that you would consider to be extravagant? Or, or maybe you would describe it as lavish or fantastic. Maybe it was something that you did, or maybe it was something that you experienced, or maybe it was something that was done for you. Now, I realize that at different times in life, um, this idea of extravagant can mean different things. For example, when Kim and I were first starting to date, something extravagant for us to do at that time would be to go to Mr. Gaddy's Pizza on a Friday night. But we had an adventurous spirit, and it was nothing for us to jump in the car and drive off somewhere and do something uh, maybe a little crazy, but we didn't have a lot of money, and uh, so because going out like that would be a bit extravagant, that was the definition for us at that time. Having been married for 34 years now, um, the fact is sometimes the extravagant thing is just simply to stay at home and enjoy a night in, in watching Netflix. So it is a little different according to where you are in life. But I remember the first time that I ever felt like I did something that was extravagant, as I can recall, um, was when I was a kid. And I want to just acknowledge those of us that had hand-me-down clothes given to us. I want us to have a moment of silence for all of those whose parents did not love them either. Just like my parents did not love me, they made me wear. I'm just kidding, of course. But I want to see a show of hands. All of you, you at home, you had to wear hand-me-downs. Yes, I see those hands. Look, my hand-me-down experience was not from an older brother, but it was from an older uncle. Now, my uncle was about five years older than I was at the time, and so uh, everything he did from the time I was 8, 9, 10 years old, everything he did, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. I thought his hair was cool. I thought his music was cool. I thought his car was cool. I thought his clothes were cool. And they were. I'm telling you, some of the clothes he gave me were the coolest clothes ever, but they were about five years out of style. Do you know what I'm talking about? Here I had these clothes that were really cool about five years ago. So I was always just outside of having cool clothes. Uh, just kind of hand-me-down stuff that was outside of whatever the popular style was at the time. I remember one particular uh, set of clothes he gave me. And you'll, when I describe it to you, you'll know why that I remember this. Um, for those of you that are young, you didn't uh, grow up maybe in the 70s or whatever... Um, you think of the 70s as way back in the dark ages, eons and eons ago, way back when nobody had any fun, and so that's where we were. But I got to tell you, there were some things that were pretty fun back then. The leisure suit, you know what I'm talking about? Some of you know what I'm talking about. My uncle gave me a leisure suit. Actually, my grandma gave me my uncle's clothes that she had bought for him, and uh, I got this leisure suit. Let me describe it to you. It was... The, the coat was a mint green. When I say mint green, it was kind of the, the color of pistachio salad. All right. And I had a dark green silky shirt that you pop the collar out over the leisure suit. Yeah, you're talking about it. You're, you're, you're visualizing it right now. And I also had a pair of double knit polyester pants. For those of you who are millennials, look it up on the internet. That was the worst cloth ever invented in the history of the world. You would stand up, and the knees would still stick out. If you got a pick in it, if you tried to pull the string, it would unravel the entire piece of cloth. So I had a pair of leisure suit uh, uh, outfit and the shirt and a pair of pants that had bell bottoms and cuffs and checks, and it was made out of double-knit polyester. And to top off the ensemble, I had a pair of brown and beige, two-tone platform shoes. Now, just let that soak in for a minute. I was a chain and a woman away from being a pimp. I mean, I'm telling you, it was, it was an outrageous-looking outfit. Um, and after a while, I got tired of wearing my uncle's pimp clothes that were handed down to me. And so I decided that I was going to do something radical. I was going to do something extravagant. I was going to do something lavish. And I had just gotten my first summer job, and I'd saved some money. And so for me to be able to go and buy something that was actually in style 
was a very lavish, extravagant thing. And so I remember going uh, to the store, and I bought a pair of these Kelly Green pants. You know what Kelly Green is? It kind of looks like you're, you belong in a St. Patrick's Day parade. I bought a pair of Kelly Green pants, and I bought a yellow, wait for it, alligator shirt. And I would pop the collar up, and it would be so cool. So I went from looking like a pimp to looking like a prep. And the fact is, I thought that was rather extravagant, that it was uh, fantastic, that it was unusual. Now, the risk of sounding like a very poor comparison when we compare this to the love of God. God's love for us is the most extravagant, amazing, lavish thing that has ever been done in the history of the world. I want you to picture with me, if you will, the, the love that God has for us. Because the story of the Bible is this, that God created a good, good earth. Everything about it was perfect. Man was perfect. All of creation was perfect. And of course, we know the story of how mankind sinned. And every person born of Adam and Eve after that point, they were born with a sin nature. They inherited that wrongdoing, that separation from God. But God, because he is a God of lavish love, because he is a God of extravagant love, he decided that he was going to make a way to get us back in right relationship with him. Now, the fact is, God could not allow sin to go unpunished because he's perfect and he's just and he's righteous. But he also had to make a way for us to be reconnected to God. And so what he did, the most brilliant, the most amazing, the most loving solution in the history of the world, the second person of the Godhead, the Son of God, became human. He entered into humanity. He lived a perfect life so that he could fulfill all the obligations of the law all the obligations of the Bible for us and represent us as a human being. But he also was God himself. And so as God, he was able to absorb all of the wrath of God, all the punishment for our sins. And as a human, he was able to uh, come before God as a righteous human being, as a righteous man. And he died on a cross for our sins. In the last moments when he was on the cross, the Bible says that he uttered, it is finished. And what was finished was God's plan for redemption. God's plan for salvation. The lavish, amazing, fantastic love of God was poured out on us for we were able to receive the free gift then of salvation and be justified and be made right with God and our sins washed away. and We would no longer be condemned. But I submit to you that none of that matters apart from the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, without the resurrection, none of this matters. Without the resurrection, there is no hope. Without the resurrection, there is no real love. Without the resurrection, there is no forgiveness. The virgin birth of Christ, pointless without the resurrection. Um, the sinless life of Christ, pointless apart from the resurrection. The deity of Christ, has no value without the resurrection. His death on the cross has no real power without the resurrection. And I must tell you today that the resurrection that we celebrate today is the cornerstone of what we believe. It is the most extravagant, most lavish act of love in the history of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, the fact is everything that we believe, it is built on the cornerstone of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the capstone that finishes the building. He is the cornerstone, the foundation upon which we build. He is all in all. And without the resurrection, we do not have the hope of the gospel. Now, for those of you that may be skeptics, I'm not going to spend much of my time today trying to convince you of the resurrection. I'm going to assume that many of you already believe that the resurrection is true. But for those of you that do not believe, let me just offer you this. There have been many of the world's greatest legal experts that have looked at the evidence. And they said that if this were a trial, that it would be a slam dunk case. That the evidence is so overwhelming 
that Jesus actually did die and resurrect from the grave, that it would be beyond any reasonable doubt for any human to doubt that he actually resurrected from the grave. I could talk about a lot of different things about that. The fact that the gospel began to spread very quickly was based on the fact that those people at that time literally believed that Jesus resurrected from the grave. So much so that they were willing to give their lives for the fact that he was now alive. He was alive and he died and was buried and three days later he came back to life for us. The fact is that There's so much overwhelming evidence that the average person, the normal person, the person that uh, is able to look at evidence would have no doubt that Jesus Christ resurrected from the grave. The fact that a non-governmental figure, Jesus Christ, in a backwoods province under the rule of the mighty Roman Empire even made it into ancient histories. The fact shows you how widespread this idea of the resurrection of Jesus Christ was at that time. It was miraculous that he's even mentioned that the resurrection is mentioned in several different ancient histories, and we can read it even today. And I want you to understand that all these things compel us to believe. And this is the question. This is where we begin. Because if you try to begin with Christianity at any other point other than Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the grave, then you'll get sidetracked. We don't start with the question, are miracles possible? We don't start with the question, is the Bible reliable? We don't start with the question, what about dinosaurs? Uh, We don't start with the question, what about the book of Genesis? We don't start with any of those questions. We start with the question, did Jesus actually die and was buried And did he actually get up out of the grave? Therein lies the question that you and I must concern ourselves with today about Christianity. Therein lies the foundation of what we believe. And I believe from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet that Jesus Christ both lived and died and resurrected from the grave and is alive today. And if that is true, I'm going to throw in my lot with the man that got up out of the grave. If it is true that Jesus was able to conquer death and get up out of the grave, then miracles are possible. Then the Bible is reliable because Jesus said that it was when he was here on this earth. And we could go down the list of our questions and none of these things matter, but all of them get answered when you answer the question about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it is the hope of the world. It is the hope of the church, and it is the hope for you and me. Well, today I want to read to you a portion of one of the resurrection stories that we find in the Gospel of John. For those of you who don't know, uh, John was one of Jesus' disciples. He was one of his 12 disciples that traveled around doing ministry with Jesus. In fact, the Bible calls John the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was very, very close to Jesus, And, and John wrote uh, the Gospel of John, the the letters of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in the book of Revelation. And we know that he knew Jesus very, very well. And all four of the Gospels contain the resurrection story. And I'm going to read part of it. Let me just set it up for for the part that we're going to read today. Um, Jesus had been arrested and tried and led to be crucified. Of course, you know the story of how he was beaten with a whip. He was, had a crown of thorns put on his head. He was nailed to a cross. And at the end, he had a spear driven into his side. And he died for our sins. He cl- declared, it is finished. What was finished? The redemption that was necessary for you and me to be made right with God. To be put in right standing with the Heavenly Father once again. Jesus was buried. And he resurrected. And we pick up the story just after the disciples had discovered that he had resurrected. And women uh, were the first ones that he appeared to. And the story we're going to pick up today is about Mary Magdalene. She was one of Jesus' followers. And she had come back after he had resurrected. And she was going to 
tend to his body or look at the tomb or whatever. And so we pick up in John chapter 20 and verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. The incredible lavish love of God is definitely shown here in this part of the resurrection story. You see, Mary was a disciple. She was not one of the 12 disciples, but she was one of many followers of Jesus Christ. And we learn about her in the book of Luke. In the book of Luke, it tells us that she had seven demons cast out of her by Jesus. I'll come back and talk about that in just a moment. She had such an amazing conversion and such a change in her life that she began to follow Jesus everywhere he went. And some believe that she even financed the ministry of Jesus because she was a woman of means, that she was able to finance all the mission, all the ministry that Jesus did. And she followed him very, very closely. And I want to show you from this passage how Three things that demonstrate to us this lavish, extravagant love of God that not only was available to Mary, but is also available to you and me today. Here's the first thing I want you to see that Jesus did for her is he removed the shame. He removed the shame. You say, what are you talking about, Richie? Well, can you imagine what it would have been like in that day, even in the day that we live in today, uh, to be demon-possessed? Now, is it possible that that was some kind of mental illness? It's possible, but I do believe that people do get possessed by demons and and harassed by demons. I believe we're tempted by them. The Bible talks about spiritual warfare and the principalities uh, of the air and so forth. But think about it. Whether it was a mental illness or whether she was demon-possessed or no matter what it was, the fact is there was a stigma that went along with that. Can you imagine how difficult it must have been for Mary Can you imagine the relationships that were ruined because of of her condition? Can you imagine how much fear she walked in from day to day, never knowing when she was going to be attacked, never knowing when she was going to have another episode, never knowing when she was going to do something that would embarrass herself? Can you imagine her reputation? The fact that her reputation took such a huge hit. She was demon-possessed. There goes the woman who is possessed by the devil. There goes the woman who has these outbreaks. She is a lunatic. She's crazy. There's something wrong with her. And no amount of money could buy back her reputation. No amount of money could put her in right social standing. Without a doubt, she was a social outcast. Without a doubt, she felt alone. Without a doubt, she felt fear. Without a doubt, she felt oppressed and separated. And we talk about social isolation today to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. But the fact is, when you are permanently socially isolated, it begins to have an impact on you. In just a few days of being socially isolated, and we're not even completely quarantined. Uh, My daughter yesterday, I heard her say, I'm sick and tired of this. i got to go outside. I can't be socially isolated anymore. Can you imagine the pain? Can you imagine the frustration? Can you imagine all that Mary went through, the fear, the ruined relationships? Maybe there are some of you that are like that today. Oh, I'm not talking about being demon-possessed, but maybe there is 
something going on in your life. Maybe it's a mental health issue, and maybe it's just as simple as depression. The, the, the fact that you have depression, it is related to mental health, but there are so many people today that are depressed because of their condition, and they're depressed because of the circumstances they find themselves in, and they're depressed because of the problems in their life. Maybe you feel that way. Maybe you feel like you've been isolated from family and friends. Maybe because of a divorce. Maybe because of a breakup. Maybe because of angry words that were said. Maybe because of something that was done to you long ago. Maybe because someone hurt you, but you feel isolated. And you feel like you have no close friends. You feel like you have no one that you can lean on. No one that you can trust on. Maybe today you feel fear just like she did. Maybe you feel like because of all the circumstances you find yourself in that you are terrified of life. You're terrified of living. And maybe because of her money, she was able to paint this pretty picture on the outside. But no amount of money could take care of what was going on in the inside. Maybe it was her relationships. Maybe it's yours. Maybe it was her fear. Maybe it's yours. Maybe it's her isolation. Maybe it's yours. Maybe it's a financial problem. Maybe it's the past. Maybe it's discouragement. Maybe it's the disgrace. Maybe it's the pain that you have felt. Maybe it's the ruined reputation or the financial stress. But I want you to see that the good news of the gospel is so vast. It's so broad. It's so lavish. It's so amazing that the very word itself, gospel, means Good news. Good news. Do you know what Jesus did for this woman who once was possessed by a demon, who once was a social outcast, who once her life was filled with pain? Do you know what he did for her? He removed the shame. And Jesus will remove your shame as well. I want you to read with me in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation. I want you to repeat it at home. No condemnation. No condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I have the greatest news for you ever. If you feel isolated or ashamed of your past or like an outcast or pain or disgrace or hurt of any kind. Jesus died for us, and he resurrected from the grave to remove the shame. I want you to see the th second thing that Jesus did was that he heals the brokenhearted. He heals the heart. You see, Mary was weeping. And Jesus, he looked at her and he said, woman, why are you weeping? There is a very significant comparison to show us of the power of the gospel, the power of life change that Jesus can do. And it is not an accident. In the story of Genesis, in the account of Genesis, we read in the creation narrative that God created all things and he created mankind on the sixth day. And it tells us that Adam looked and he didn't find a helper that was suitable for him. God had tasked him with naming the animals. And the Bible tells us that God put him to sleep and took a rib from his side, and therefrom, thereof he made a woman. And the very first human words that are recorded for us, ever spoken by a human being, the very first word was woman. Woman. She will be called woman. Woman. Jesus shows us, and the writers of the New Testament show us, that Adam was the first Adam, but he failed. He sinned. He blew it. He broke the relationship with God. He disobeyed. He rebelled. But the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the second Adam. What does that mean? Adam is our human representative as the federal head of humanity. He sinned. He failed. The Bible calls Jesus the second Adam. And what does that mean? That he stepped in as our human representative. And even though we are not perfect, he is. Even though we can't live a perfect life, he did. And even though we can't keep all the law, he did for us. He fulfilled it for us. He kept it for us. And the very first word that the risen Christ spoke was woman. 
What does that tell us? It tells us that he heals the broken heart. He heals those that are broken hearted. He heals those that are far from him. He heals those that do not know or experience the love of God. Jesus died on the cross and he resurrected from the grave to heal your heart. He did it to remove the shame. And the last thing we see is he made it personal. He made it personal. He said to her, Mary. He called out her name, Mary. You see, for many of us, we believe that God so loved the world. We believe that God can love everyone, that Jesus died for the world. We see the big picture. We can believe that God loves other people. The difficulty that we have sometimes is believing that God actually loves us. Oh, sure, he died for the world, but did he really die for me? Sure, he loves the world, but has he forgotten about me because of my circumstances? When I look around my world today, it doesn't feel like God is there. It doesn't feel like God remembers me. It doesn't feel like God loves me. But Jesus made it intensely personal when he called out her name, Mary. Mary, and he is calling out your name as well. And friends, I want you to know today that you and I have hope. Because of the lavish love of God that was poured out on us from the Father through the Son as he died on the cross and was buried, but he resurrected from the grave three days later. Well, what does that tell us? It tells us that God wants to have a personal relationship with you, that he loves us, that he wants to know us, and he wants you to be a part of his family. I alluded to the gospel earlier as good news. And it is the greatest news that the world has ever known. And so today, I want to offer to you that good news. Maybe today, you're hearing the gospel presented clearly, maybe for the first time. That's true of a lot of people. Or maybe you heard it when you were younger and you didn't really understand it. But today, you did. Or maybe you've heard it before and you understood it, but you weren't really ready. But now, you are. I want to invite you today, right now, As you're watching this service, I want to invite you to open up your life just like Mary did. I want you to open up your life to the Son of God, to Jesus Christ. I want you to open up your heart to his amazing, lavish love. Say, Pastor Richie, how do I do that? Well, the good news is that Jesus did everything that was necessary. When he said, on the cross, it is finished, what he meant was that all that was necessary for salvation to be a free gift from God was done. It was accomplished. He died for our sin. He took the punishment from God for our sin. And he conquered death when he resurrected. And he offers to you and me a free gift of salvation. You can call it whatever you want. You can call it salvation. That's a biblical word. You can call it being saved, becoming a Christian. A lot of people use that term. The Bible calls it being born again, talking about the spiritual rebirth that happens when you receive Christ by faith. You can call it crossing the line of faith. It doesn't really matter what you call it. What matters is, do you reach out and receive it? And if you're ready to do that, I want to lead you in a very simple prayer. You see, prayer is simply talking to God. It's simply calling out to God. The Bible tells us in the book of Romans that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. What does that mean? Well, it means that you don't depend on your own self. Like Mary, she wasn't good enough. Like anyone else, you and I are not good enough either. On our own, we don't get to compare to our neighbor to go to heaven. We have to compare to Jesus Christ, and every single one of us falls short. But the good news is you can call on him. He did everything that was necessary, and you can call on him in prayer. I want to lead you in that simple prayer. If you'd like to pray that today, I want you to pray it right along with me. If you have family that want to pray it, and you all want to pray it aloud, pray it out loud together. But here's what you pray. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. And I believe you died on the cross and were buried and rose from the grave. 
And I believe you offer me the free gift of salvation. I want you to give me the faith right now to trust you, dear Jesus. And I'm not trusting in myself, but I'm trusting in you. I'm asking you to forgive me, save me, and change my life. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the good news is the Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's really what Easter is all about. It is about sharing the good news of Jesus, that you can be made right with God, that you can be forgiven, that your past can be healed, that the shame can be removed, that He will heal and mend your broken heart, and that He wants a personal relationship with you. What good news. Here's what I'd like for you to do today. We do this every year on Easter. We call it a spiritual survey. You'll find it in the description there online. You can click it on. And I would ask everyone, if you would, please... Fill this out. Take a moment. It won't take but a minute. And if you've got family members that prayed, record their response as well. But we use A, B, C, and D. A, you put down the letter A on your response card if you prayed to receive Christ just now. Every year at Easter, we have many people that pray and trust Christ as their Savior. I hope you'll do that today. I hope you did do that today. Um, B, I've already received Christ. When I fill out a card, I will always mark B because I've prayed to receive Christ when I was eight years old and got baptized and followed Christ. Um, C is for those that say, you know what, I didn't pray today, but I am interested. I want to think about it for a while. And then the letter D, for those of you that say, I'm going to be honest, I'm not really interested right now. And, and the reason we ask for that response is that it requires honesty. It requires a real assessment of where you are. And we by no means are upset with you for putting that down. But we do know how to pray for you, and we want to know how to love you better. All right? And so if you'll put that down, if that's your response, just be honest about it. A, I pray to receive Christ today. Well, I hope you'll do that today. For those of you that wonder what your next step is, if you pray to receive Christ, your next step is filling out that card. Uh, if you're new to Avalon Church and you would like to know more about Avalon Church, fill out the next step card that's available online there as well. We will offer baptism soon. We also have what we call our next step class, which we offer every month, two services during the month. Um, and uh, we actually have it available online that you can uh, go and take the next step class if you'd like to become a member of Avalon Church or learn more about that. And then... I want to encourage you today to give in our offering. We've said repeatedly that we want to make these services, though they are unusual, we want to make them as normal as possible. So we have worship, we have prayer, we have a message, and of course, we have an offering. Let me challenge you on the offering. I realize that for many, there is a great panic about our economy right now. And we want you to know that we believe in grace giving here at Avalon Church. We don't pressure people to give. But I do believe the Bible, and I believe the Bible makes a promise to us that when we give, when we tithe, the, the Bible promises us that God will be our warrior. He will rebuke the devourer for, for our sakes. The devourer is the devil, the enemy. Um, you can say that the coronavirus is a devourer. It devours health. It devours finances and resources and hope and the Bible is very clear that, and we want this for you, not from you, that when you tithe, when you give, now is the time to rebuke the devourer. And so we would ask you, if you normally give, uh, then just go ahead and, and do that. Do that online. There's a couple ways you can give. You can give by clicking the tab there as you're watching, giving at avalonchurch.net, or you can text to give, 84321, 84321. You can text and give any amount. And that goes right uh, to Avalon Church. And so I want to thank you for your faithfulness to give. Thank you for the hope that you're offering. And I want to encourage you during this week, this Easter week, that you offer hope to somebody. We have an opportunity as the church to make sure that we present the gospel, that we present hope to a world that maybe has lost its mind a little bit, that we present the hope, the sanity that is in Jesus Christ. And I'm so, so very happy that you joined us today. Thank you for being a part of the service today. 
And my prayer is that today will be a great day in your life and that you will receive the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. God bless you. I love you. And have a great day. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.